Good evening and welcome to the Penn Transplant Institute's Liver Transplant Virtual CME Program. I'm Denny DuPont, Manager of Outreach and Communications at the Penn Transplant Institute. Before we get started, I'll be quickly reviewing CME information and explaining the Q&A portion of the session. Tonight is the final event in our three-part series, and this evening we will be providing in-depth information about liver transplant for alcohol-associated liver disease. Regarding CME credit, this evening's event will provide one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. After the session, you will receive an email from the Penn CME office with guidance on completing the evaluation and receiving credit. There will be a time set aside at the end of the presentation for Q&A. At that time, you can unmute your mic and ask your questions. If you have questions during the presentation, you can ask them in the chat and our faculty will answer your question during the time set aside for Q&A after the presentation. The faculty members presenting this evening are Dr. Ken Rosti, Dr. Jonathan Nehas, and Dr. Ethan Weinberg. Dr. Ken Rostein is Director of Regional Outreach and Regional Hepatology and Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Rostein is a member of the International Liver Transplant Society and several national professional organizations, including the American College of Physicians, the American Transplant Society, and the American Liver Foundation. His work has been published in the journal Hepatology, the Journal of Liver Transplantation, and the Journal Transplantation. Dr. Rothstein is joined today by Dr. Jonathan Nehas. Dr. Nehas is the Director of Inpatient Hepatology and Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Before coming to Penn, Dr. Nehas completed a fellowship in transplant hepatology at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, New York and a fellowship in gastroenterology at Montefiore Medical Center in New York. He is a member of the American Society of Transplantation, the American College of Gastroenterology, and the American Gastroenterological Association. His work has been published in the Journal of Gastroenterology, Liver Transplantation, and the Clinical Liver Disease Journal. Also presenting this evening is Dr. Ethan Weinberg, Dr. Weinberg joined the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania in 2016 after completing a fellowship in gastroenterology and hepatology at New York Presbyterian Hospital while Cornell Medical College in New York. His work has been published in several important publications, including the American Journal of Gastroenterology and the journal Hepatology. Dr. Rothstein will be getting us started this evening. Welcome, Dr. Rothstein. Welcome. <coughs> Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Ethan is gonna help with my slides. Um, so let's start off with acute alcoholic hepatitis in 2022. Next slide. This is a picture of me in medical school 40 years ago when I met Jimmy Carter, President Jimmy Carter, and a lot has changed in 40 years. Personally, I've lost a lot of hair and gained a lot of weight. In the field of medicine, a lot has changed as well, especially hepatology. So back then, almost all the liver disease that we saw were complications related to cirrhosis as a result of alcohol use. Eventually, hepatitis C took over and then fatty liver started as well. And with the advent of curing hepatitis C, now we're starting to see a lot more complications of cirrhosis due to fatty liver and alcoholic liver disease. The pandemic has made things much worse. Next slide. The, the US spends over $230 billion taking care of the ramifications of alcohol abuse. 
It's thought that there are over 2 million people in the US with some form of liver disease due to alcohol. And this may be underestimated due to the social stigma as many patients don't wanna admit that they're drinking excessively. Next. There are different stages of alcoholic liver disease. Almost all heavy drinkers develop fatty liver, but a, small, a smaller percentage, maybe up to 25%, will develop alcoholic hepatitis. And believe it or not, a smaller percentage of those patients will develop cirrhosis. It usually takes over 10 years of excessive alcohol use for this to occur, even though I did have one patient early on in my career who after seven years of heavy drinking developed cirrhosis. She started drinking at age 12 and by 19 had biopsy proven cirrhosis. Next. There are some key points that I want you to take away tonight. This is a clinical syndrome of inflammation of the liver with injury to the hepatocytes and fibrosis. You do need to have longstanding consumption of large amounts of alcohol, but often in recent times, you're drinking more than before. The main therapy, the best therapy is to never drink alcohol again. In my experience, only about 50% of my patients can stop drinking. There are many scoring tools to assess prognosis and response to treatment. We'll go over a couple of those. Patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis should be considered for steroids. We'll talk about that as well. And back when I first started 40 years ago, we would never think of transplanting somebody who came in with acute alcoholic hepatitis. But that has changed, and my colleagues will talk about the real possibility of doing transplants for patients who come in with severe acute alcoholic hepatitis, especially those patients that don't respond to treatment. Next slide. As I said before, alcoholic hepatitis causes more considerable mortality and morbidity. This is an old slide. It's probably closer to 70,000 hospital admissions in the US with an average length of stay of close to a week Patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis who do not receive steroids have a one month mortality of close to 35%. And if you don't respond to steroids, you have a very, very poor prognosis. And that's a group of patients where we do think about liver transplant as opposed to previously. Next. Patients usually present with jaundice. They look like they're in full blown liver failure. They can have a fever and ascites cephalopathy, usually the liver's enlarged. Uh, it's usually between the ages of 40 and 60s, but again, we've seen patients younger than this. Women are actually at a greater risk, but due to the fact that more, more male patients drink excessively, we see more male patients with alcoholic hepatitis. Like I said before, the woman I spoke of, seven years of drinking, age 19, had cirrhosis, very petite woman, who uh, drank excessively for only seven years before she presented. Next slide. We usually see the serum AST greater than two times the upper limit of normal, more so than the ALT with a ratio of one and a half to two, but the enzymes are really above 300. The white cell count, the bilirubin, the INR, INR are elevated. And what I always talk about with my patients and the medical team is when you see an increased creatinine, that's a very bad sign because these patients usually die from renal failure and or infection. So when I see a creatinine going up, I get very concerned that they're developing a paddle renal syndrome with a very poor outcome. Next slide. Like I said before, when they come into the hospital, obviously we want them to stop alcohol and continue to stop alcohol. We have to take care of their withdrawal syndrome. And we also need to treat their alcohol addiction. I don't have time to go through that, but we get psychiatry involved. There's pharmacotherapy, pharma psychotherapy, but really I'm gonna focus in on the medical management of these patients. Next slide. I feel all patients with alcoholic hepatitis should undergo a full screening for infection, including a chest X-ray, blood cultures, urine culture. If they have ascites, do a diagnostic paracentesis. We don't empirically treat them with antibiotics, but we follow them very closely for the development of infection. Next slide. 
We know that these patients have a very high risk for hepatorenal syndrome. So we try to avoid antibiotics like aminoglycosides, try to avoid giving them contrast, definitely no NSAIDs. Um, sometimes they'll need to be on albumin. Uh, we don't use Trentol anymore. That's fallen out of favor. Next slide. These are the prognostic scores that we use. Madre's discriminant function involves the prothrombin time of the bilirubin. We all know about the MELT score. And also I'll cut down to the bottom. The LEAL score definitely gives us prognosis after someone's been on seven days of therapy with steroids. So in the old days, you would give patients 28 days of steroids with the inherent risk of infection. But now we know within seven days if it's gonna work. If it works, we continue on for a full course. If it's not gonna work after seven days, we stop the steroids and then we move on to other options. Next. Again, these are various different things that have been tried. And the only thing that we really think about using now is the top line corticosteroids. I personally was not a very big fan of corticosteroids early on. I had a lot of patients dying of infection, but as time went on, and I got a little bit more experience with it and some other studies came out, I am now a firm believer in using steroids in those patients that are eligible. Next. Okay. This was a meta-analysis of many different randomized controlled trials, which showed a clear significant difference in survival in those patients treated with steroids, close to 80% at one month compared to 65% uh, without uh, steroids. And again, we'll know within a week if you're gonna be in that group that's gonna to respond to steroids. So we're not putting you through unnecessary exposure to steroids. Next. The patients who are eligible for steroids have to have a discriminant function over 32. So it's the prothrombin minus the control in seconds times 4.6, and then you add the serum bilirubin. If it's greater than or equal to 32 or the MELD's greater than 21, those patients are eligible for treatment. We don't want to start the steroids if they have active bleeding, infection, also if they're in renal failure. And then we have the LEAL model at uh, day seven, which gives you whether or not these patients are going to survive. So you can see at the bottom, if you have a good response with the score less than 0 0.45, your survival is 85%, which is excellent. Unfortunately, if you don't respond and your score is above 0.45, you have a 25% survival. And previously, before transplants, these patients did very poorly, did not survive at a very high rate. Now we have the fallback position of potentially doing a liver transplant, even if they walk into the hospital drinking. Next slide. So let me just try and summarize. This is a clinical syndrome of inflammation of the liver with a lot of injury, fibrosis. You need long-standing alcoholic hepatitis. A couple of weeks of drinking will not do it. It's years of chronic excessive alcohol use. You have to stop drinking to have long-term survival. We have ways to figure out who's sick, who needs to be treated. We wanna put people on a four week course of steroids, but we know within a week if they're going to respond. And finally, the last bullet, which I'll hand over to my younger colleagues, is we now accept the fact that transplant may be an acceptable therapy for selected patients with severe alcoholic hepatitis who do not respond to steroids. And I think that's my last slide. And it is, and I'll be waiting for questions. All right, well, thanks, Kenny. That was a great lead in. Let me just share my screen now and get started on um, the next portion of the talk. All right, so uh, my name's John Nahas, one of the other hepatologists here at Penn, and I'll be discussing early liver transplantation for alcohol-associated liver disease.
So uh, first I'd like to start off with a review on the preferred terminology in patients with alcohol-associated liver disease. The Dallas Consensus Conference met in 2019 to help provide a framework for ALD. And among other things, this conference made recommendations to standardize nomenclature. Uh, the emphasis was on using less stigmatizing terminology. They proposed replacing the use of the word alcoholic with alcohol associated, and also recommended use of relapse to describe a return to drinking instead of recidivism, which actually has legal instead of medical connotations. Alcohol-associated liver disease has been considered a potential indication for liver transplant since the 1980s. Uh, early case series from Thomas Starzl, the father of liver transplantation, demonstrated a willingness to perform transplant for ALD despite recent alcohol use. And this was in, in an era before pre-transplant psychosocial assessments. So in one of his early case series, 11 of the 73 patients transplanted for ALD uh, had abstinence for less than six months. And this experience demonstrated relatively similar survival and relapse rates in those who had not had a pre-specified period of sobriety. Additionally, a 1983 NIH consensus conference on liver transplantation identified ALD as an appropriate indication for transplant. Another early case series from Pittsburgh observed that ALD patients transplanted with less than six months of sobriety had higher rates of relapse than those transplanted with more than six months. And around the same time, a UK report came out documenting three patients transplanted without pre-transplant periods of sobriety all return to drinking after transplant. As a result, a consensus recommendation for a six month waiting period of abstinence was advised. And this was adopted by most transplant centers. Until recently, adherence to the six month abstinence requirement essentially excluded patients from consideration. However, due to high short and medium term mortality in patients with severe ALKEP, we know that many of them don't have six months to wait. This, uh, the six month rule was challenged by a landmark 2012 prospective multicenter study from France and Belgium demonstrating that early liver transplantation, i.e. done before six months of abstinence for ALKEP is both feasible and life-saving. So this trial emphasized the need for careful candidate selection with only about 10% of potential candidates having favorable psychosocial profiles to be considered for early transplantation. Notably, candidates are required to have non-response to glucocorticoids, severe ALKEP as their first liver decompensating event, meaning they've never been diagnosed with ALD or admitted for a liver-related issue in the past, strong social support, absence of severe mental health comorbidities, commitment to post-transplant sobriety, and consensus of all members of the medical team for candidate selection. 26 patients ultimately underwent early liver transplantation. Again, that is with no pre-specified period of sobriety. In follow-up, these patients demonstrated improved six-month survival compared to historical controls, with survival at 77% compared to 23%, with a relatively low impact on organs, around 3% of all transplants, and low relapse rates at around 15%. The findings of this trial upended the notion of a six month waiting period as the primary alcohol use disorder related criterion for transplant eligibility. And efforts to confirm these findings have largely come from the United States. The American Consortium of Early Liver Transplantation for Alcoholic Hepatitis or Accelerate AH is a group of 12 centers across the US involved in early liver transplantation. This consortium published a retrospective study in 2018 documenting the US experience. It included 147 patients undergoing early liver transplantation for severe ALKEP from 2006 to 2017. All had less than six months of abstinence and patient survival was 94% at one year and 84% at three years. I'd now like to go through some of the macro trends occurring in transplantation. So alcohol associated liver disease has emerged as the most common indication for liver transplant in the United States. This has coincided with a decline in transplant for hepatitis C since the introduction of direct acting antiviral therapy, as well as a shift in attitudes regarding pre-specified periods of sobriety before transplant. This has allowed more patients with ALD to actually survive to undergo liver transplantation. Note that reports of early transplant for alcohol-associated hepatitis were published in the major journals in 2011 from Europe, 
in 2016 from Mount Sinai in New York City, with abstracts at annual society meetings occurring prior to that, helping to spark further adoption of the practice. This recent publication from Thomas Cotter looked at changes in waitlisting patients for ALCAP. From 2014 to 2019, liver transplantation for ALCAP increased fivefold, from 28 transplants in 2014 to 183 in 2019. The number of transplant centers performing early transplant for ALCAP also increased over that time, from 14 in 2014 to 47 in 2019, with at least one quarter of all centers having performed at least one. The number of transplants for ALCAP increased at a greater rate than any other indication for liver transplant, yet still accounts for only around 2% of all liver transplants in the US. In addition to these temporal changes, major regional variations have occurred as well. The increase in transplant for ALCAP excuse me, has been primarily driven by the three UNOS regions in the Northeast, where ALCAP accounted for about four to four and a half percent of all transplants in 2019. And this is an eightfold difference compared with other UNOS regions across the country. And this disparity is thought to be primarily a consequence of center policy as binge drinking rates in the Northeast are among the lowest in the US. These trends have only increased since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, during which alcohol consumption and alcohol related hospitalizations have both gone up substantially. Tess Bitterman from Penn compared waitlisting and liver transplantation for ALCAP during the first year of the pandemic to the two years prior. Note the sharp increase in the lines after the first state level shelter in place orders went into effect. There was a more than a 100% increase in waitlist additions for ALCAP and a more than 200% increase in patients undergoing early transplant for ALCAP during this period, both substantial increases during the COVID-19 pandemic. Bitterman also looked at waitlist trends and outcomes in this context. So in a retrospective cohort study using the UNOS database, patients with ALCAP were compared with other patients with a meld at listing of greater than or equal to 30. Between 2008 and 2019, new waitlist additions for ALCAP increased six and a half fold with more rapid increases since 2014. These patients were transplanted with relatively short waiting times of around 10 days. MELD score was higher among the ALCAP candidates at 36 versus 35, and this was driven by higher serum bilirubin levels. Nonetheless, waitlist mortality was consistently lower in the ALCAP group. And more recently, there's been a decline in waitlist mortality with ALCAP patients from 16 during the period from 2014 to 2017 to 6% from 2018 to 2020. Uh, other groups also experienced a decline in waitlist mortality, but it was less pronounced over the same duration. Additionally, delisting for clinical improvement was rare in the groups, but higher in the ALCAP cohort. So these results summarize that ALCAP was associated with reduced waitlist mortality and higher transplant rates compared with other high meld patients. Based on these findings, there's a question of whether allocation policy adjustments should be put in place to avoid disadvantaging other high meld patients. So with this background, another issue is public perception when transplanting patients with recent alcohol use and concerns about a potential public backlash. A group from the University of Kansas performed a survey in 2014 regarding public opinion on liver transplantation in patients with less than six months of abstinence. The survey provided background information on liver transplant, early transplant for ALCAP, and the controversial aspects of those reports. The participants were given nine case vignettes that described fictional patients with severe ALCAP in need of early liver transplant, each of whom estimated with a shorter than six month survival. The participants were asked to rate how they would feel if these fictional patients underwent early liver transplantation from one to 10, one being very upset, 10 being very pleased. So among the 503 participants, roughly two thirds intended to be organ donors. And of those surveyed, 82% indicated that they would be at least neutral to news of a nearby, a nearby transplant program performing liver transplant for severe ALCAP. About three quarters of respondents indicate that early transplant in any one of the vignettes would not make them hesitate to donate their organs. So the results of this study suggest that early transplantation for carefully selected patients with severe ALCAP may not be as controversial to the public as previously thought. When considering patients for early liver transplantation, the psychosocial evaluation is crucial. Often these patients are younger with fewer comorbidities 
And the medical pre-transplant evaluation can sometimes be straightforward. A multidisciplinary psychosocial team with a transplant social worker and mental health professional should interview each patient. And while there is no firm set of criteria, many centers have adopted a similar protocol to the initial Franco-Belgian study. The goal is to identify which patients are prohibitively high risk for early liver transplantation and should not move forward with waitlisting on that index admission. Uh, over the next few slides, we'll go through some of the components of the psychosocial evaluation using objective measures, scoring systems, and some other high risk features. So to start the discussion on the pre-transplant evaluation, I'd first like to highlight a paper from the University of Wisconsin that emphasizes the lack of transparency in transplant evaluations for alcohol-associated liver disease. So this group reviewed the official websites of 141, all 141 UNOS registered liver transplant centers in 2018. Any information on transplant eligibility was provided by only about half of the centers. Only 17% discussed alcohol at all, despite it being the leading indication for transplant and 4% of centers reported a required period of abstinence. 2% of centers indicated that six months was required. And this study highlights the challenges that patients face due to the lack of available information on expectations regarding alcohol use. A recent study from Mount Sinai revisited the question of what proportion of patients are acceptable psychosocial candidates for early liver transplantation. Among the 193 patients with severe ALKEP evaluated at this center, 88% were ineligible for or non-responders to medical therapy and subsequently considered for early liver transplant. The vast majority of these patients were declined, most commonly due to psychosocial concerns at 75% that did not meet the psychosocial criteria, while 7% were declined for medical reasons such as septic shock. Ultimately, 17% were cleared for listing and only 9% underwent early liver transplantation during that index admission. These results emphasize the key role of the psychosocial evaluation in assessing early liver transplant candidates as the vast majority will not meet the psychosocial threshold. So with that information, let's review some of the tools we use to evaluate these patients to determine who is an acceptable candidate. The SIPAT score is a comprehensive screening tool first published out of Stanford in 2012 in an effort to standardize the psychosocial listing criteria for organ transplantation. It assesses four domains, patient's readiness level and illness management, social support system level of readiness, psychological suitability and psychotherapy, and lifestyle and effective substance use. Each of those four domains is scored and the patient is given a final score from zero to 110, with higher scores indicating higher psychosocial risk. Patients can then be grouped into risk classifications based on their score. Scores up to 20 are excellent or good candidates, 21 to 39 are deemed minimally acceptable, and 40 plus are high risk candidates. A group from here at Penn recently assessed the impact of the SIPAT score on liver transplant wait list decisions and post-transplant outcomes. They looked at over 400 patients who underwent liver transplant between 2014 and 2017 and had SIPAT scores during their pre-transplant evaluation. Patients were divided into two groups, SIPAT score less than 21 and greater than or equal to 21. Note that patients with a SIPAT score greater than or equal to 21 were more likely to have alcohol-associated liver disease at 46% versus 19%. Elevated total and SIPAT domain scores were associated with not being added to the wait list. A high SIPAT score was also associated with post-transplant immunosuppression non-adherence. And SIPAT readiness score of less than or equal, excuse me, greater than or equal to five was associated with biopsy proven rejection post-transplant. So the same Accelerate multi-center group used regression modeling to develop a predictive score of four pre-transplant variables in an effort to identify patients at low risk for sustained alcohol use after transplant. This is known as the SALT score. The variables were greater than, four, greater than 10 drinks per day at initial presentation, uh, multiple prior rehab attempts, prior alcohol-associated legal issues, and prior illicit substance use. A composite SALT score of less than five had a 95% negative predictive value for sustained alcohol use after transplant. And to distinguish between sustained alcohol use and a slip, sustained alcohol use was defined as greater than 100 days of alcohol. A SALT score of, less, of greater than or equal to five, however, only had a 25% positive predictive value. So its best use is to identify those low risk patients. And this paper also reported an incidence of sustained alcohol use at one year of about 10% and at three years at 17% post-transplant. 
uh, which is roughly similar to historical data on ALD patients with six months or more of abstinence. The group here at Penn also recently published this study in which they evaluated high-risk features and assessed the predictive capability of the CIPAT and SALT scores on post-transplant relapse among patients with alcohol-associated cirrhosis. They included all 155 patients transplanted for ALD cirrhosis at Penn from 2011 to 2017. Patients with ALCAP were not included in the study as the primary focus was on those patients with chronic ALD. In this cohort, 20% of patients met criteria for alcohol relapse defined as any alcohol consumption post-transplant. And what they found is the relapse group was more likely to have relapsed after a prior initial attempt at sobriety pre-transplant, have required alcohol-associated uh, liver disease hospitalization, either for treatment or alcohol-associated hepatitis, have refused to complete an intensive outpatient program despite recommendation, and was less likely to have stopped alcohol consumption when first diagnosed with liver disease. A CIPAT score of greater than or equal to 21 was associated with alcohol relapse with a hazard ratio of 6.4. A SALT score of greater than or equal to 7 was also associated with alcohol relapse with a hazard ratio of 2.3. And what they found in this study also was that mean length of sobriety was higher among those subjects that did not experience relapse. However, the median duration of all patients was still greater than six months. Another paper from the Accelerate cohort tried to further identify those patients who are at the highest risk. And while inclusion criteria in prior studies used ALCAP as the first liver decompensating event, this was essentially an empiric criterion without data to support its inclusion, despite strong anecdotal evidence. And among Accelerate sites, they actually identified several patients who had undergone early liver transplant despite a prior decompensation. And the prior decompensation group included patients who had a previous diagnosis of ascites, encephalopathy, variceal bleeding, or jaundice, and any evidence of alcohol use after this event. They found that post-transplant survival was worse among those with a prior decompensation, with increased adjusted post-transplant mortality and an adjusted hazard ratio of 2.7. Unadjusted survival among those with a first versus prior decompensation was 93% versus 86% at one year, and 85% versus 78% at three years. Prior decompensation was also associated with harmful alcohol use post-transplant as a hazard ratio of 1.77. And these findings validate the first decompensation as a criterion for consideration early transplant patient. However, note that the three-year survival was still nearly 80% in those who had decompensated prior to their LCAP transplant. The last slide I'll have on pre-transplant risk assessment comes from the artificial intelligence out of an Accelerate cohort study. Using psychosocial evaluations from early liver transplant recipients across different centers, they developed an AI model to predict post-transplant harmful alcohol use. And the group identified specific variables related to social support and substance use as highly important. This preliminary model may help in selection and post-transplant management, while keeping in mind that it should not replace the transplant committee selection process but can help to aid in the discussion. In my last few slides, I'd like to review the Dallas consensus recommendations regarding early liver transplantation for alcohol-associated hepatitis. Uh, these criteria can help provide centers with a standardized approach to transplant evaluation in the absence of a widely adopted national listing policy. So regarding criteria related to alcohol-associated hepatitis, this should be the patient's first decompensation event there should not be severe uncontrolled medical or psychiatric comorbidities, and the patient should be either a non-responder for, non-responder to, or ineligible for medical therapy. For criteria related to alcohol use disorder, patients should be deemed acceptable risk of relapse by a multidisciplinary psychosocial team. Also, the assessment should occur on an awake, interactive patient who is not overtly encephalopathic or unable to participate in the interview and multiple prior unsuccessful attempts at rehab are discouraged. Patients should not have current substance use or dependency, and the patient should accept his or her diagnosis with evidence of insight and have a strong social support system. Both the patient and support persons should be dedicated to lifelong abstinence. And lastly, a set of post-transplant requirements should be in place. So patients should, not have, should have a plan for alcohol use disorder treatment after transplant, Centers should engage in post-transplant monitoring for relapse during clinic appointments, and caregivers and support persons should be interviewed as well. 
And the routine use of alcohol, alcohol biomarker testing is recommended for at least two years post-transplant. Uh, so in this section, we reviewed the history of liver transplantation for alcohol-associated liver disease, the more recent adoption of early transplant for ALKEP, the increase in transplant for ALD overall, and a discussion on the evaluation process and high-risk features in patients being considered for early liver transplantation. Future efforts and directions remain focused on candidate selection and pre-transplant prediction models to enhance equity, transparency, and reproducibility. Thank you for your attention, uh, and I will uh, pass it off to the next section or open it up to any questions now. All right, good evening. Um, Nathan Weinberg, I'm gonna be talking about uh, part three, uh, sort of after a transplant. So we've decided to list someone for transplant and transplanted them <clears throat> through the early liver transplant pathway. It is now uh, on us to work with our patients to prevent them, uh, to, to help them um, avoid uh, alcohol relapse. So it's important to know that between eight to 22% of, of patients will relapse in their first year after transplant. And between 30 to 40% of patients will relapse within five years of a transplant. And that's around a quarter of patients will have heavy alcohol use. Um, and around 10% of patients actually confirm to pathologic drinking, um, which is defined as drinking that results in withdrawal symptoms or, or serious uh, physical or social injury. So there are some protective factors against relapse. Um, most important being patient and family recognition of alcohol dependence, uh, degree of social stability, and the nature and extent of changes in lifestyle that are conducive to long-term alcohol abstinence. So if these, are, these things occur, patients are less likely to relapse after transplant. So why is relapse, alcohol relapse after transplant bad? Well, it's associated with many bad outcomes. So there are um, histopathologic changes that occur within the liver. You can get uh, alcohol-associated hepatitis again post-transplant. You can get graft damage, graft loss, and um, decreased survival. So all of these things are things that we're trying to avoid after a liver transplant. So one of the um, uh, unfortunate findings that we're seeing is that after liver transplants, we're seeing an excess in mortality of young women that are transplanted for alcohol-associated liver disease. And when I say young women, this is, you know, uh, women that are below the age of 40. So if you look at these lines on the left, you see the red and the green. These are women below the age of 40, and they're tracking or along the same survival with women in their 70s. This is different than men after transplant. We see that in general, young men do fairly well after transplant. So we're still trying to get to the root of this. And um, we have, at Penn, we have programs to work with patients to try to prevent alcohol relapse because we know that um, particularly young patients are, are, are at highest risk of relapse uh, and the excessive um, morbidity mortality that follows. So what I'm showing you here is alcohol use patterns post liver transplant. Not everyone drinks at all, and some people drink differently. But this study from 2010 from Demartini showed that there were sort of five groups, and this is looking at alcohol use. This is um, patients that are transplanted for alcohol-associated liver disease, not necessarily alcohol-associated hepatitis. But there were three groups, groups one and two. Um, groups one were completely abstinent. Group two um, had minimal alcohol use uh, late. Group three, as you can see here in the green, had um, sort of early alcohol use um, and a fair amount of drinking. Group four was late but heavy. And group five was heavy and early. And what Demartini noted was that it was only those patients in groups three, the early and moderate, or the early and heavy, that experienced deaths associated with alcohol, uh, post-transplant deaths associated from alcohol relapse. This is a study that uh, Penn was a part of, uh, part of the Accelerate cohort. <clears throat> in 
what we were doing was we were looking to see um, what alcohol use looked like after liver transplant for alcohol associated hepatitis. And we found similar patterns, not exactly the same as what Demartini described, but there were clear patterns. So uh, we, we found four particular patterns. Pattern one was abstinent. Patients did very well. Uh, likelihood of survival was uh, close to 100%. Pattern two was uh, sort of minimal use um, and not heavy. And those patients also did well. It was pattern three and pattern four where it was either uh, early use but not heavy was pattern three and pattern four was early use and heavy, so binge drinking. And those were the patients who experienced early use, whether it was heavy or not heavy, um, had the highest risk of death in this cohort of patients. So, we recognize that alcohol relapse is a concern. So after a liver transplant, we want to, we work closely with our patients to prevent alcohol relapse. And, to, and if, if patients do have alcohol relapse, to try to get them help. So how do we check for alcohol relapse? Um, the oldest way is probably the GGT. We tend to see that going up, but it's not specific. These other biomarkers that we see, CDT, ETG, they're okay, but what we've sort of gravitated to is the phosphatidyl ethanol or PETH for short. It is, um, it looks more at chronic alcohol use and the way that I tend to describe it uh, to my residents and fellows that I work with is it's, think of a hemoglobin A1C, uh, but for alcohol, it'll sort of tell you what, um, and it's, it can be slightly different because of the way a patient, every, everyone metabolizes differently, but a, an elevated phosphatidyl ethanol is a, good indicator that someone is drinking uh, significant amounts of alcohol. And so in general, at our site, when we see that it's in uh, triple digits, then um, you know, we, we know that that that's, uh, suggests real chronic alcohol use or relapse. So now that we can, once we recognize alcohol relapse, we need to be able to treat it. So it's important to note that alcohol use disorder is a chronic relapsing condition, and this is similar to hypertension or diabetes. And patients that have alcohol use disorder have a, have a stigma attached to it in a way that patients with hypertension and diabetes don't. And uh, it's important to know that it's AUD is a, it's a comorbid psychiatric illness. There's often nicotine dependent, other substance use, poor health, uh, literacy, and for some reason with alcohol use disorder, we tend to say that they should have one addiction treatment and then they're expected to remain abstinent without further monitoring intervention. And that's really unrealistic. So uh, we work closely with our patients after transplant, we monitor for alcohol use, and we also have means of getting uh, patients uh, treatments. So, we recognize that our patients have higher rates of acute illness, organ rejection, cancer, mortality, but a lot of our patients are resistant to alcohol treatment. They feel it's not needed and they're too busy dealing with other parts of their post-transplant care. So it's important for patients with alcohol use disorder to feel comfortable talking to their providers and social workers, psychiatrists about alcohol cravings, um, or alcohol use uh, so that we can uh, initiate treatments. But if they feel it's not needed, we, that's a, a barrier that we have to overcome. So the next two slides are treatments. So this is a very busy slide and you can look at it in your, if you wanna pause it later and look at it. Um, but what I wanna show you is that it's not all Alcoholics Anonymous and that would be the 12 step program. There are lots of other psychotherapy uh, methods <laughs> to help people with alcohol use disorder. So if a patient says, well, AA is not for me, don't stop there. There are other methods, individual counseling, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, a lot of different ways that we can get patients involved to help them uh, with their alcohol use disorder. So psychotherapy alone will work for some patients, but not all. So it's important to know that there's also pharmacotherapy. It's a long list of different medications that can work in some patients. 
Um, at our program, we tend to use naltrexone. Um, it is safe to use in patients with liver disease pre or post transplant. It does say there's elevated transaminases documented and rarely hepatotoxic. It's not something that I've seen. And we've used it a lot in our patients with liver disease. And I talk to them, I tell them that this can help with their cravings. Uh, we've used both the oral version or for patients that have a harder time uh, sticking to it, but have significant cravings, we'll use the intramuscular version. I have less experience with some of the other ones on this list. Um, I would say from experience, it does. most of those have other side effects that are um, a little bit more uh, unpleasant. And now Trexone people tend to take and uh, the side effects tend to be somewhat minimal. We do tend to reserve naltrexone for after any post-surgical problems uh, because of its um, uh, anti-opioid effects. It is an anti-opioid. It's, it's the same ingredient used in Narcan to um, reverse uh, opioid overdose. And so when patients have post-transplant surgical pain, we don't want them to undergo uh, unwanted pain. So we wait until they're out of that window um, where uh, they may still have pain from their surgery. So the next part of this talk, I want to talk to you about a novel program that we have at Penn. And it's our post-transplant early liver transplant pilot program. So this came about during the pandemic. And what we noticed was we really transplanting, uh, like the national trends, we're transplanting more and more patients for acute alcohol-associated hepatitis now than ever. And we looked back at our numbers and from, from early 2019 to late 2021, we, we transplanted almost 30 patients. And this was a significant increase from our priors. We were just seeing more of it. And as Dr. Nehas alluded to, everyone in the country is seeing more of it. And we think, is it is due possibly to the pandemic? Um, if that were the case, maybe we'd see this come down a little bit. But we're not seeing our numbers really coming down for, the, for evaluations and transplants and for this indication. Um, but it's not, so it's not going away. And we, we, there are a lot of people we wanna help and we need to be able to help them after the transplant as well. So we developed a program for patients that undergo early liver transplant for alcohol use disorder. And these slides are courtesy of one of our um, transplant psychiatrists, Dr. Uh, Gaswami. And we, uh, we developed the, a team, the Transplant Education for Alcohol Management. And so, Dr. Nehas and Dr. Rothstein, are, are, we're, we're all part of the team. We have our transplant psychiatrist, Dr. Weinreb and Dr. Swami, are part of the team, our pre-transplant coordinators and our post-transplant coordinators and our social workers. And once a month we meet uh, online and discuss our patients and what we can do to help them. And what came out of that, well, this is, these are our team members, um, was that we really, we were having a hard time getting patients um, into uh, programs. Patients would often tell us, um, uh, I, I don't feel comfortable because a lot of patients are, are sicker than me and I have a liver transplant. Some patients told, said that they had guilt associated with it because they were still alive and you know other people were waiting for a transplant or turned down for a transplant. Um, and so, uh, in our meetings, we talk about what we need to do to help patients if, if they're having trouble following up, if they've relapsed, how we can reach out to them, if people need, uh, haven't made appointments, how we can get them back into care. And so this all starts pre-transplant. So uh, any patient that is recognized as not being able to have the adequate um, Pre the, the long enough pre-transplant evaluation that we see with our more our chronic uh, alcohol-associated liver diseases. Um, at, during the hospitalization, they sign a letter of agreement prior to listing that they will work with us. And this is reviewed both by um, the hepatologist and the transplant psychiatrist. And then they agree to engage in a treatment program within 90 days. And they also agree to be randomly screened for alcohol and substances. And they'll follow up with the transplant team, transplant psychiatry and social worker, and agree to family involvement uh, in case we're not able to get in touch with them. So we have our patients um, every, for the first three months, they meet, for the first month, they meet every week with the transplant uh, post coordinator. And then every other week for the first three months and monthly after that, 
uh, for medical management. And they see the hepatologist every three months in the first year. And they're working with their transplant psychiatrist and social worker every four weeks for the first year. So we do use PETS about every three months for the first two years post-transplant. We also do urine tox screens every three months. We do a depression screen and anxiety screens as these are comorbid conditions that can occur with AUD. So we were having trouble, patients were having a hard time finding groups that they felt comfortable with. So we, um, we are collaborating with um, the Penn Presbyterian Medical Center Addiction Unit, and we formed a special um, intensive outpatient program for those that undergo early um, liver transplant for um, ALCAP. Um, we created this in order to, to help those patients feel comfortable talking about their shared experience. So they can now say, not as much, I don't feel comfortable, those people aren't like me, to, oh, these patients are like me. We're all, we're, all, we're all going through the same type of thing. We have been lucky to receive a liver transplant and we have a team that is trying to help us so we can try to help each other. So our post-liver transplant uh, group, it's 12 weeks, it's about three months. There is an intake and there's a primary therapist. And there's also individual counseling sessions that are available either once a week, twice a month, or once a month. And there are group sessions that are once a, once a week for 12 weeks. So we piloted this last year. We had 17 patients referred, 10 engaged in the group. Uh, one didn't continue um, after attending two groups. And then there were six of the 17 that refused to do it. But we did, we had nine patients fully engaged. And these are, this is a smattering of the different topics that are covered. Each week has a different topic. So you can take a look at that. And the outcomes of the pilot study, they were great. No patients died. All of the patients that are in the pilot study are alive. And they also remain engaged. A lot of these patients have continued to work, not, not every week, but um, frequently. Um, we have had some alcohol relapse, but that's to be expected. But those patients who did relapse felt very engaged in care with their transplant team and have been receptive to um, pharmacotherapy. So they were already in psychotherapy and they're receptive to pharmacotherapy and they're doing well and they're taking their medications and they're following up. So this is good. We've had very positive feedback from our participants and um, we are... Uh, we are working on uh, trying to extend this also to pre-transplant because we found this to be extremely successful. So uh, this is the last slide for the, for the whole CME, but um, it's important to know that alcohol accounts for almost 4% of annual global mortality worldwide. And the majority of these deaths are due to alcohol-associated liver disease. Alcohol-associated liver disease has emerged as the most common indication for liver transplant in the United States and patients with ALCAP are at increased risk of relapse post-transplant. And if you have a robust alcohol treatment and follow-up plan, you can prevent relapse and improve patient outcomes post-transplant. Thank you. So um, Dr. Rothstein and Dr. Nehas and I will now take uh, any questions. Uh, I don't know if there's any in the chat. Don't see any in the chat at the moment, but feel free to put them in and we'll keep monitoring that. Ethan, can I make one point? Of course. I mean, I have to tell you that I was shocked by how many patients were being admitted with acute alcohol hepatitis during the pandemic. And I thought it would slow down a little bit as the pandemic kind of drifted away, so to speak. But yet, I'm still seeing a lot of patients when I'm on the inpatient service getting admitted, getting transferred in. And to me, it's, it's just that there were two or three years of intense heavy alcohol use. And that sort of tipped them over the edge. I don't think it necessarily, it may have slowed down a little bit because they're going back to work, they're not at home. But I still think it's gonna be an increase and we're gonna to continue to see it for a couple more years till things get back to normal. So I was just wondering what, what your thoughts were on that. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing the same trends. Uh, our, our numbers for transplant evaluations for patients with LCAP haven't really slowed down despite um, COVID slowing, not so, the, the COVID numbers being much lower. Um, I think it's, it's a, people are not getting the, you know, the, the help they need early. Um, and, and we're also seeing it as, as the, uh, the acceptance for liver transplant for early liver transplant is, is becoming increasingly accepted. Uh, we're, I think we're also seeing more referrals because in the past, you know, uh, maybe someone wouldn't refer to us, but now we're seeing more and we have a, I feel like a, a good system to evaluate um, and evaluate quickly. Um, and we feel more confident in those patients that we put forward that we can help them afterwards too. Along those same lines, I will tell you that when I talk to referring gastroenterologists, I get the feeling that a lot of them still feel like this is not an accepted treatment for these patients. And it took me a while to, to accept that it's reasonable. In my opinion, it cannot be a patient that has been in and out of rehab, has known they've had liver disease for a long time, and yet still continues to drink. To me, it has to be someone who really it's their first presentation with severe alcoholic liver disease. I mean, I've had a couple of patients who've been told by their doctor five years ago, your enzymes are up a little bit. You probably should cut back a little bit on your drinking, but never really told that you absolutely have to stop drinking. But so I think we the 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 consensus that I have is that we really need to look at every patient on an individual basis, look at them very carefully, do a thorough evaluation, and make a team decision on whether or not we're going to proceed with transplant or not transplant them and have them go for rehab and, and get better. Yeah, yeah I, think, I agree. Go ahead, Dr. Nath. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, I think that's part of the challenge is that, you know, we're still sort of figuring out who are these highest risk patients that can't proceed with early transplant and would be better served going to, you know, uh, if they have the time going to an outpatient rehab program being reassessed in the future. Because, you know, as we've seen, even with some of the studies that Dr. Weinberg had sort of been a co-author on that, you know, these patients, even if they go back to drinking, some of them will still have good survival in the sort of several years down the line, but that kind of puts a dent in the donor pool and, you know, does put them at risk of higher relapse of, you know, rejection, not taking their immunosuppression. And we want to make sure that we are carefully selecting these patients. The other thing that I'll add that uh, was a small point in my portion was that when we we're speaking to these patients, it's really important that we talk to an awake patient and someone who can interact with the psychosocial discussion, because you need to make sure that this patient has insight and especially if it is their first decompensating event that, you know, we don't sort of transplant an intubated patient who wakes up and has really not gone through that experience of LCAP in the pre-transplant, even if it's a development of insight during their hospitalization, kind of goes through that process with us. Um, and, you know, it's still, as you said, a sort of team discussion and making sure that we have, you know, our competent social workers, transplant psychiatrists, addiction specialists, everyone involved with a seat at the table. Uh, to really help kind of make decisions that are essentially life or death at a certain point, and that we have everyone's support moving forward. Can I make one more comment to what you just said? I mean, it is clear to me that a transplanted liver reacts differently to excessive use of alcohol. So typically it takes decades before a liver becomes cirrhotic from alcohol. But in my own experience, when you have a transplanted liver and people return to drinking, that liver goes downhill very quickly. And it's due to the combination of excessive alcohol use directly damaging the liver in combination with not necessarily taking your anti-rejection medications. So you're having acute rejection and alcoholic damage. And these patients tend to lose their, their organs very quickly within a year or two, if not a, a couple of years. So I think Dr. Weinberg's program is just so important to really not forget about these patients and to keep a very close eye on them and give them the support they need so they can abstain from alcohol. 
Yeah, and to that point, you know, um, for many of these patients, really, the liver transplant isn't so much the end of their journey, but really kind of the beginning, as now they're starting to become into this alcohol use disorder treatment pathway that previously had been, you know, not anything on their radar. So as everyone has stressed to this point, that the important thing is not forgetting about them and, you know, saying we've, okay, transplanted the liver, moving on, but remembering that these <coughs> patients have this comorbid alcohol use disorder that needs to be very aggressively managed after transplant when they are at high risk for graft rejection, relapse, things like that as they're feeling better. Yeah, one of the things that we're seeing is though our trans, our post-transplant sort of uh, group program, I'm not aware of any other programs in the country that do this, but there is this um, push towards a multidisciplinary model. And so that, that's what we that's what we're doing. This is a multidisciplinary model to treat uh, to help treat our patients because it, it is complicated. It's not just one uh, physician or you know a healthcare provider that can treat um, alcohol addiction, uh, alcohol use disorder, and and the consequences. Uh, it takes a lot of people, and so that's what we've recognized. And so we are we are working together as a group to. Um, to help our patients. And sometimes what that also has entailed is that we are also learning from our psychiatrists. So over the past few years, I've actually become more comfortable prescribing naltrexone uh, on my own if I see one of my patients who is, who's had an alcohol relapse. So rather than saying, oh, you got to wait to see the psychiatrist, I'll say, oh, I'll talk to my patient. I'll, I'll talk to them about starting naltrexone and I'll make a follow-up appointment to see them very quickly also getting them in to see our social worker and our psychiatrist. But it, as, as being a part of the multidisciplinary team, I've also felt more and more comfortable to, to help our patients when they have had an alcohol relapse. Thank you very much. And if there are no other questions, we'll wrap up the session. I wanna thank you to our faculty for that, the informative session. And thank you to our guests for joining us this evening. You will be receiving an email regarding the CMEs for the session. Please check your inbox in your email. And thanks again for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, thanks everyone.